All right, so today we come to the final two chapters of book one, The Two Dead Girls of the Green Mile by Stephen King. Just a recap of chapters five and six. There's not a whole lot that goes on in chapters five and six. We meet Paul Eskom's wife. We have a brief look into his home life, um, playful banter between the two of them at night once he goes home. The next morning, when Paul arrives to work, he sees there's a note on his desk for him to come to the office of the warden, Warden Morris, who we, who we also meet. And we learn a little bit about um, what's going on in Warden, warden Morris' wife. We learn that he is married and that his wife is sick, uh, very much so, actually. And he is very concerned about it. We also learn that the connections that were hinted at that Percy has, has come have come to bear. Those that he's connected to were not happy about the fact that Paul sent him to do manual labor and are not happy about it, have expressed that to the warden who was then passing that information on to Paul. But Paul learns that there is maybe a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. He learns that he may be able to be rid of Percy a little bit sooner rather than later if he allows Percy to do something that he had no intention of doing and has to be out front on an execution. Preferably the next one, which the board and tell, which he also finds out is scheduled to be Edward Delacroix. Although Paul is very reluctant to do this, he kind of he accepts it because he sees it as an opportunity to be rid of Percy, which he wants pretty much more than anything right now. He also learns that there's another prisoner coming to the bile, a young William Wharton who has made a name of himself for a crime and murder spree across the South. William Wharton is described as being crazy, and we will learn that he is every bit of that. William Wharton will be a very central character in some of the major events that happen in the story to come. So without further ado, chapter seven of The Green Mile, book one, The Two Dead Girls by Stephen King. Delacroix's mouse was one of God's mysteries. I never saw one in Ebot before that summer, and never saw one after that fall when Delacroix passed from our company on a hot and thundery night in October. Passed from it in a manner so unspeakable I can barely bring myself to recall it. Delacroix claimed that he trained that mouse, which started his life among us at Steamboat Willie, but I really think it was the other way around. Dean Stanton felt the same way, and so did Brutal. Both of them were there the night the mouse put in, put in his first appearance, and, as Brutal said, the thing was half half came already, and twice as smart as that cage never but thought he owned it. Dean and I were in my office, going over the record box for the last year, getting ready to write follow-up letters to witnesses of five executions, and to write follow-ups to follow-ups and another six, stretching all the way back to 29. Basically, we wanted to know just one thing. Were they pleased with the service? I know it sounds grotesque, but it was an important consideration. As taxpayers, they were our customers, but very special ones. A man and woman who were turned out at midnight to watch a man die has got a special, pressing reason to be there. A special need. And if execution is a proper punishment, then that need ought to be satisfied. They've had a nightmare. The purpose of the execution is to show them that the nightmare is over. Maybe it even works that way, sometimes. Hey! Brutal called from outside the door where he was running, manning at the desk at the head of the hall. Hey, you two, get out here! Dean and I gazed at each other with identical expressions of alarm, thinking that something had happened to either the Indian from Oklahoma, his name was Arlen Bitterbuck, but we called him the Chief, or in Harry Tillberg's case, Chief Goat Cheese, because that was what Harry claimed Bitterbuck smelled like, or the fellow we called the President. But then Brutal started to laugh, and we hurried to see what was happening. Laughing in E-Block sounded almost as wrong as laughing in church. Old Tutu, the trustee who ran the food wagon those days, had imbibed with his holy rolling cart full of goods, and Brutal had stocked up for a long night. Three sandwiches, two pops, and a couple of moon pies. Also a side of potato salad, two had undoubtedly filled from the prison kitchen, which was supposed to be off limits to him. Brutal had the log book open in front of him, and for a wonder, he hadn't spilled anything on it yet. Of course, he was just getting started. What? Dean asked. What is it? State legislator must have opened up the purse strings enough to hire another screw this year after all, Brutal said, still laughing. Look at yonder. He pointed, and we saw the mouse. I started to laugh, too, and Dean joined in. 
You really couldn't help it because a guard doing quarter hour check rounds was just like was just like that mouse looked like. A tiny furry guard making sure no one was trying to escape or commit suicide. It would trot a little way toward us along the green mile, then turn his head from side to side as if checking the cells. Then it would make another forward spurt. The fact that we could hear both of our current inmates snoring away in spite of the yelling and laughter somehow made, made it even funnier. It was a perfectly ordinary brown mouse, except for the way it seemed to be checking into the cell. It even went into one or two of them, skipping nimbly in between the lower bars in a way I imagine many of our inmates, past and present, would envy. Except it was out that the cons would always want to be skipped, of course. The mouse didn't go to into either the occupied cells, only the empties. And finally, it had worked its way almost up to where we were. I kept expecting it to turn back, but it didn't. It showed no fear of us at all. It ain't normal for a mouse to come up on people that way, Dean said a little nervously. Maybe it's rabbit. Oh, my Christ, Bruno said through a mouthful of corned beef sandwich. The big mouse expert, the mouse man. You see it foaming at the mouth, mouse man? I can't see his mouth at all, Dean said, and that made us all laugh again. I couldn't see his mouth either, but I could see the dark little drops that were his eyes, and they didn't look crazy or rabbit to me. They looked interested and intelligent. I put men to death. Men with supposedly a mortal soul that looked dumber than that mouse. It scurried up the green mile to a spot that was less than three feet from the duty desk, which wasn't something fancy like you might be imagining, but only the sort of desk that the teachers used to sit behind up at the district high school. And there it did stop, curling its tail around its paws as prim as an old lady selling her skirts. I stopped laughing all at once, suddenly feeling cold through my flesh all the way to the bones. I want to say I don't know why I felt that way. No one likes to come out with something that's going to make them look or sound ridiculous. But of course I do. If I can tell the truth about the rest, I guess I can tell the truth about this. For a moment, I imagined myself to be that mouse. Not a guard at all, but just another convicted criminal there on the Green Mile. Convicted and condemned, but still managing to look bravely up at that death that must have seemed mile high to it, as the judgment seat of God will no, do no doubt someday seem to us and at the heavy-voiced, blue-coated giants who sat behind it. Giants that shot his kind with BB guns, or swatted them with brooms, or set traps on them. Traps that broke their backs while they crept cautiously over the word victor to nibble at the cheese on the little copper plate. There was no broom by the duty desk, but there was a rolling mop bucket with the mop still in the ring. I'd taken my turn at swabbing the green leno, and all six of the cells shortly before sitting down to the record box with Dean. I saw that Dean meant to grab the mop and take a swing with it. I touched his wrist just as his fingers touched the slender wooden handle. Leave it be, I said. He shrugged and drew his hand back. I had a feeling he didn't want to swat it any more than I did. Brutal tore a corner off his corned beef sandwich and held it out over the front desk, tweezed delicately, delicately between two fingers. The mouse seemed to look up with an even livelier interest, as if it knew exactly what it was. Probably did. I could see his whiskers twitch at his nose wiggle. Oh, brutal no, Dean exclaimed, then looked at me. Don't let him do that, Paul. If he's going to feed the damn thing, we might as well put the welcome mat for, out for everything with four legs. I just want to see what he'll do, Brutal said, in the interest of science like. He looked at me. I was the boss, even in such minor detours from routine as this. I thought about it and shrugged like it didn't matter much one way or the other. The truth was, I kind of wanted to see what he'd do, too. Well, he ate it, of course. This is where there was a depression on, after all. But the way he ate it fascinated us all. He approached a fragment of sandwich, sniffed his way around it, and then he sat up in front of it like a dog doing a trick, grabbed it, and pulled the bread apart to get it to meat. He did it as delicately and as knowing as a man tucking into a good roast beef dinner in his favorite restaurant. I never saw an animal eat like that, not even a well-trained house dog. And all the while he was eating, his eyes never left us. Either one smart mouse or hungry as hell, a new voice said. It was Bitterbuck. He had awakened and now stood at the bars of his cell, naked except for a pair of saggy seated boxer shorts. A home rolled cigarette poked out from between the second and third knuckles of his right hand, and his iron gray hair lay over his shoulders, once probably muscular but now beginning to soften in a pair of braids. You got any engine wisdom about Mises, Chief? Brutal's ass, watching the mouse eat. You were all pretty fetched by the neat way it held 
the bit of corned beef in his forepaws, occasionally turning it or glancing at it, as if in admiration and appreciation. No, Peter Buck said. No, the brave once had a pair of what he claimed were mouse skin gloves, but I didn't believe it. Then he laughed, as if the whole thing was a joke, and left the bars. We heard the bunk creak as he lay down again. That seemed to be the mouse's signal to go. It finished up what it was holding, sniffed at what was left, mostly bread with yellow mustard soaking into it, and then looked back at us, as if it wanted to remember our faces if we met again. Then it turned and scurried off the way it had come, not pausing to do any cell checks this time. Its hurry made me think of the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, and I smiled. It didn't pause at the door to the race restraint room, but disappeared beneath it. The restraint room had soft walls for people whose brains had softened a little. We kept cleaning equipment stored in there when we didn't need the room for its creative purpose, and a few books. Most were westerns by Clarence Mudford, but one, loaned out only on special occasions, featured a profusely illustrated tale in which Popeye, Bluto, and even Wimpy, though hamburger friend, took turns with olive oil. There were craft items as well, including the crayons that Corey later put to some good use. Not that he was our problem yet. That was earlier, remember. Also in the straight room was a jacket no one wanted to wear. White, made of double zone canvas, and with the buttons and snaps and buckles going up the back. We all knew how to zip up problem, a problem child in that jacket, look at these slips. They didn't get violent off in our lost boys, and when they did, hope, brother, he didn't want to wait around for the situation to improve on his own. Brutal reached to the desk drawer above the keyhole and brought out the big leather-bound book with the word visitor stamped on, on front in gold leaf. Ordinarily, that book stayed in the drawer from one month to the next. When a prisoner had visitors, unless it was a lawyer or a minister, he went over to the room off the mess hall that was kept special for that purpose. The arcade, we called it. I don't know why. Just what in the gory do you think you were doing, Dean Stanton asked, peering over the tops of his spectacles as Brutal opened the book and paged grandly past years of visitors to men now dead. Obeying Regulation 19, Brutal said, finding the current page. He took the pencil and licked the tip, a disagreeable habit of which he could not be broken, and prepared to write. Regulation 19 stated simply, Each visitor to E-Block shall show a yellow administration pass and be recorded without fail. He's gone nuts, Dean said to me. He didn't show us his pass, but I'm going to let it go this time, Brutal said. He gave the tip of his pencil an extra lick for good luck, then filled in 9.49 p.m. under the column headed Time on Block. Sure, why not? The big process probably probably make exceptions for mice, I said. Of course they do, Brutal agreed. Lack of pockets. He turned to look at the wall clock behind the desk, then printed 10.01 in the column headed hit Time Off Block. The longest space between these two numbers was headed name of visitor. After a moment's hard thought, probably to muster his limited spelling skills, as I'm sure the idea was in his head already, Brutus Howell, Brutus Howell carefully wrote Steamboat Willie, which was what most people called Mickey Mouse back in those days. It was because of that first talkie cartoon where he rolled his eyes and bumped his lips around and pulled the whistle cord in the pot house of the steamboat. Fair, Brutus said, slamming the book closed and returning to his drawer. All done and buttoned up. I laughed, but Dean, who couldn't help being serious about things even when he saw the joke, was frowning and polishing his glasses furiously. You'll be in trouble if someone sees that. He hesitated and added, the wrong someone. He hesitated again, looking nearsightedly around, almost as if he expected to see that the walls had grown ears before finishing. Someone like, Percy kiss my ass and go to heaven wet more. Huh, Brutal said. The day Percy Wetmore sits his narrow shank down here at this desk will be the day I resign. You won't have to, Dean said. They'll fire you for making jokes in a visitor's book if Percy puts the right word in the right ear. And he can. You know he can. Brutal glowered but said nothing. I reckoned that later on that night he would erase what he had written. If he didn't, I would. The next night, at the getting first bitter book and then the president over the D-block, where we showered our group after the regular times were locked down, Brutal asked me if we shouldn't have a look for Steamboat Willie down there in the restraint room. I guess we ought to, I said. We had a good laugh over that mouth the night before, but I knew that if Brutal and I found it down there in the restraint room, particularly if we found it had gnawed itself the beginnings of a nest in one of the padded walls, we would kill it. Better to kill the scout, no matter how amusing it might be, than to have to live with the pilgrims. 
And I shouldn't have to tell you, neither of us was very squeamish about a little mouse murder. Killing rats was what the state paid us for, after all. But we didn't find Steamboat Willie, later to be known as Mr. Jingles, that night, not nested in the soft walls or behind any of the collected junk we hauled out into the corridor. There was a great deal of junk, too, more than I would have expected, because we hadn't had to use the restraint room in a long time. That would change with the advent of William Morton, but of course, we didn't know that at the time. Lucky us. Where'd it go? Will asked. Wiping sweat off his back, off the back of his neck with a big blue bandana. No hole, no crack. There's that, but he pointed to the drain in the floor. But all the grate which the mouse could have gotten through was a fine steel mess and not even a fly could have passed. How to get in? How to get out? I don't know, I said. He did come in here, didn't he? I mean, the three of us saw him. Yep, right under the door. He had to squeeze a little, but he made it. Gosh, Brutal said, a word that sounded strange coming from a man that big. It's a good thing the cons can't make themselves small like that, isn't it? You bet, I said, running my eye over the canvas walls one last time, looking for a hole, a crack, anything. There was nothing. Come on, let's go. Steamboat Willie showed up again three nights later when Harry Tilburg was on the duty desk. Percy was also on and chased the mouse back down the green mile with the same mop Dean had been tried thinking of using. The rotor avoided Percy easily, slipping through the crack beneath the restraint room door, a hands-down winner. Cursing at the top of his voice, Percy unlocked the door and hauled all that shit out of him. It was funny and scary at the same time, Harry said. Percy was vowing he'd catch the duck that damn mouse and tear his diseased little head right off. But he didn't, of course. Sweaty and disheveled, the shirt shirt of his uniform hanging out in the back, he returned to his duty desk half an hour later, brushing his hair out of his eyes and telling Harry, who had sat serenely reading through most of the ruckus, that he was going to put a strip of insulation on the bottom of the door down there. That was all the rumor problem, he declared. Whatever you think is best, Percy, Harry said, turning a page of the old opera he was reading. He thought Percy would forget about blocking the crack at the bottom of that door, and he was right. That's the end of chapter seven. I suggest you pause here, answer the questions about chapter seven, before continuing to listen on to chapter eight. And now the final chapter of The Green Mile, book one, The Two Dead Girls by Stephen King, chapter eight. Late that winter, long after these events were over, Brutal came to me one night when it was just the two of us. E block temporarily empty and all the other guards temporarily reassigned. Percy had gone on to Briar Ridge. Come here, Brutal said in a funny, squeezed voice, maybe look around at him sharply. I had just come in out of a cold and sleepy night and had been brushing off the shoulders of my coat prior to hanging it up. Something wrong, I asked? No, he said. But I found out where Mr. Jingles was staying when he first came, I mean, before Delacroix took him over. You want to see? Of course I did. I followed him down the green mile to the restraint room. All the stuff we kept stored there was out in the hall. Bruder had apparently taken advantage of the lull in customer traffic to do some cleaning up. The door was open, and I saw our mop bucket inside. The floor, the same sick lime shade as the green mile itself, was drying in the streaks. Standing in the middle of the floor was a stepladder, the one that was usually kept in the storage room, which also happened to serve as the final stop for the state condemned. There was a shelf jutting out from the back of the ladder near the top. The sort of thing a workman would use to hold his toolkit or paint of the bucket he was working out of. There was a flashlight on it. Brutal handed it to me. Get on up there. You're shorter than me, so you have to go pretty near all the way. But it'll hold your legs. But I'll hold your legs. Ridiculous down there, I said, starting up. Especially my knees. I'll mind that. Good, I said, because a broken hip's too high a price to pay in order to discover the origins of a single mouse. Huh? Never mind. My head was up by the cage light in the center of the ceiling by then, and I could feel the ladder wiggling a little under my weight. Outside, I could hear the winter wind moaning. Just hold on to me. I got you, don't worry. He gripped my calves firmly, and when I went up one more step. Now the top of my head was less than a foot from the ceiling, and I could see the cobwebs, see in the cobwebs, a few interesting sp in enterprising spiders that spun in the crotches. Let me reread that. Now, the top of my head was less than a foot from the ceiling, 
and I could see the cobwebs a few enterprising spiders that spun and the clotches where the roof beams came together. I shone the light, shone light around, but didn't see anything worth the risk of being up there. No, Brutal said. You're looking too far away, Paul. Look to your left where those two beams come together. You see them? One's a little discolored. I see. Shine a light on the joint. I did and saw what he wanted me to see almost right away. The beams had been pegged together with dowels, half a dozen of them, and one was gone, leaving a black circular hole the size of a quarter. I looked at it, then looked doubtfully back over my shoulder at Brutal. It was a small mouse, I said. But that small? Man, I don't think so. But that's where he went, Brutal said. I'm just as sure as houses. I see how you can be. Lean closer. Don't worry, I got you. And take a whiff. But there's the ass, groping with my left hand for one of the other beams, and feeling a little better when I had a hold of it. The wind outside gusted again. Air puffed out of that hole into my face. I could smell the keen breath of a winter night in the border south, and something else as well. The smell of peppermint. Don't let nothing happen to Mr. Jingles, I could hear Delacroix say in a voice that wouldn't stay steady. I could hear that, and I could feel the warmth of Mr. Jingles as the Frenchman handed it to me. Just a mouse, smarter than most of the species, no doubt, but still just a mouse for that and that. Don't let that bat and hurt my mouse, he said. And I promise, as I always promised him at the end when walking the Green Mile was no longer a myth or a hypothesis or something they really had to do. Mail this letter to my brother, who I haven't seen for 20 years. I promise. Say 15 Hail Marys for my soul. I promise. Let me die under my spirit name and see that goes on my tombstone. I promise. It was the way you got them to go and be good about it. The way you saw them into the chair sitting at the end of the green mile with their sanity intact. I couldn't keep all of those promises, of course, but I kept the one I made to Delacroix. As for the Frenchman himself, there had been hell to pay. The bad and had hurt Delacroix, hurt him plenty. Oh, I know what he did, all right. But no one deserved what happened to Ella De- uh, Edward Delacroix when he fell into old Sparky's savage embrace. Smell of peppermint. And something else. Something back inside that hole. I took a pen out of my breast pocket with my right hand, still holding onto the beam with my left, not worried anymore about Brutal inadvertently tickling my sensitive knees. I unscrewed the pen's cap one-handed, then poked the nib in and teased something out. There was a tiny splinter of wood which had been tinted a bright yellow. And I heard Delacroix's voice again, so clearly this time that his ghost might have been lurking in that room with us, the one where William Wharton spent so much of his time. Hey, hey, you guys, the voice said this time, the laughing, amazed voice of a man who had forgotten, at least for a little while, where he is and what awaits him. Come and see what Mr. Jingles can do. Christ, I whispered. I felt as if the wind had been knocked out of me. Found another one, didn't you, Brutal asked. I found three or four. I came down and shone a light on this big, outstretched palm. Several splinters of wood were scattered there, like jack straws, jack straws for elves. Two were yellow, like the one I had found. One was green, and one was red. They hadn't been painted, but colored with wax Crayola crayons. Oh, boy, I said in a low, shaky voice. Oh, hey. It's pieces of that spool, isn't it? But why? Why up there? When I was a kid, I wasn't big like I am now, Brutal said. I got most of my growth between 15 and 17. Until then, I was a shrimp. When I went off to school for the first time, I felt as small as, why? As small as a mouse, I guess you'd say. I was scared to death. You know what I did? I shook my head. Outside, the wind gusted again. In the angles formed by the beams, cobwebs shook in the feathery draft like rotted lace. Never I had been in a place that felt so nakedly haunted, and it was right then, as we stood there looking down at the splinter of remains of the spool, which had caused so much trouble, that my head began to know what my heart had understood ever since John Coffey had walked the Green Mile. I couldn't do this job much longer. Depression or no depression, I couldn't watch many more men walk through my office to their death. Even one more might be too many. I asked my mother for one of her hankies, Brutal said. So when I felt weepy and small, I could sneak it out and smell the perfume and not feel so bad. 
You think what? That the mouse chewed off some of that colored spool to remember Delacroix by? That a mouse? He looked up. I thought for a moment I saw tears in his eyes, but I guess I was probably wrong about that. I ain't seeing nothing, Paul, but I found them up there and I smell peppermint same as you. You know you did. And I can't do this no more. I won't do this no more. Seeing one more man die in that chair just about killed me. I'm going to put in for a transfer to Boys Correctional on Monday. If I get it before the next one, that's fine. If I don't, I'll resign and go back to farming. Who did you have a farm besides rocks? It don't matter. I know it doesn't, I said. I think I'll put in with you. He looked at me close, making sure I wasn't having some sport with him, then nodded as if it was a settled thing. The wind gusted again, strong enough this time to make the beams creak and settle, and we both looked around uneasily at the padded walls. I think for a moment we could hear William Wharton, not Billy the Kid, not him. He had been wild billed to us for his first day on, from his first day on the block screaming and laughing, telling us we were going to be damn glad to be rid of him, telling us we would never forget him. About those things, he was right. As what Brutal and I agreed on that night in the restraint room, it turned out just that way. It was almost as if we had taken a solemn oath on those tiny bits of colored wood. Neither of us never took another part in another, never took part in another execution. John Coffey was the last. To be continued. Thus ends The Green Mile, book one, The Two Dead Girls. Next week, we will start on book two, The Mouse on the Mile. Make sure that you go back to the quiz, answer the questions on chapter eight, and submit it when you are done. Until then, until we see each other again.